People looking at cosmic rays started noticing that there were these strange Vs in the cloud chambers and things, and they didn't seem to correspond to any of the known particles when we looked at the effective mass that they were and so on. So they kept looking for more and more of these things. They started building bigger accelerators, and the more accelerators they built at the universities and so on, the more of these odd particles they found to the point where chaos sort of reigned. There was a lot of confusion. And everybody had learned the trick of making the wavelength smaller. And so they thought the only way to get to the bottom of this is we've got to get together, make a really big experiment, too big for to build at a university, and uh, big enough that university people could come here, do experiments, and maybe sort out this uh, confusing problem that was, was going on at the time. When this all happened, the, in the Soviet Union, they had built a machine that was about uh, 70 billion electron volts, which was bigger than anything we had by a little more than a factor of two. And they were trying to do physics with it over there. We had to have a bigger one. So <laughs> it goes back to the thing about guys, you know. That, <laughs> So anyway, a group of universities got together, Universities Research Association, and contracted with what was the Atomic Energy Commission at the time, and they ended up hiring a director, Bob Wilson, who had worked with Lawrence at Berkeley, had worked on the Manhattan Project, and he was both a physicist and an artist. So you see his imprint on this laboratory in many ways, like this building and the arches you come through when you drive in sculpture out front. Anyway, this is Wilson. He was our first director. He had been, he had grown up in Wyoming on a ranch. I have a really cool picture of him on a bareback on a bucky and bronco. Uh, I'll have to put that in sometime. Anyway, he, I hate to admit it, but he was the director when I came here. And uh, so I've worked for all the directors so far. This is what our accelerator complex looks like more or less these days. There are nine accelerators in the complex that do a couple of things. One thing is not shown on here. Uh, but we accelerate in stages. Some of you will walk past this area and see how this all happens today. And we accelerate in the LINAC here, AJUB booster, 120 or 150 JUB main injector, depending on what you're doing. Take beam out of the main injector, hit a target, make antiprotons, collect antimatter here, save it up eventually put it into the Tevatron, where it goes around this way, collides with matter coming the other way, and these two big detectors, which aren't quite right here. Uh, this one's really over here. And, but this is what public <laughs> affairs does with these cool drawings. So that's the complex. Some of you, you will see this today. Some of you will see it next week. That's where it all starts. This is a very old-fashioned 1930s Cockroft Walton generator. There's 750,000 volts between here and the wall, so you want to get yourself in between there. <laughs> Lightning frequently strikes across there. In fact, yesterday when I was showing your tour guide this device, uh, lightning was striking a couple of times. I don't like it when lightning strikes, because it means it's not working right. <laughs> this is the Tevatron, and this is a superconducting accelerator, uh, the most powerful accelerator collider in the world right now. We do have competition coming online in Geneva, Switzerland, but we're going to get everything we can out of this before we turn off. This is the old main ring, and part of it is left in our tunnel. But this is the original machine that Wilson built. We use part of it now to transport beam out to the switchyard, and part of it to, to transport protons down to where we inject them in, into an external line where we make the antiproton. This is what one of the big collider detectors looks like. They're very complicated, very big. Uh, we used to think these were the most humongous things in the world, but if you look at the, some of the pictures across the way of the big detectors being built at CERN, CMS and Atlas, uh, they're amazing. And to see them in person is even, it's awe-inspiring. People build such huge things. Anyway, this is a tracking chamber. What happens is the matter and the antimatter collide in the center here. Lost our good pictures. We need to put some in. But particles come streaming out. You can have one proton and one antiproton colliding 
and 87 particles come flying out of there and uh, leave tracks in this detector going to these calorimeters where their energy is measured and things like that. And how do you get so much out of just two particles colliding? E equals mc squared, which was one of, one of the previous transparencies. There's a lot of kinetic energy. You can convert that into mass. And so all kinds of things come out of there. You can make very heavy top quarks, which are about 175 times as massive as the proton itself, and yet it's a component of the proton. It only exists virtually in the proton. And hopefully Higgs particles and other things beyond our wildest dream come out of there. Here's how you make a top quark, what happens, and how you know you made it. Uh, what happens is because, because that wavelength is so short, you have direct quark-on-quark -quark collisions, and you can produce these things in pairs. They decay in a particular way. We can sort those decays out in our detectors and tell that we have them. This quark was, was discovered here. This is sort of our modern periodic table of the elements where we have listed six quarks that we know about, two discovered here at Kearney Lab, and then the leptons. There's the electron, the heavy electron I told you about, the muon, and the tau, and then they each have a neutrino associated with them. And over in this column are the force carriers that are like the photon that I showed you, and I also showed you a force for the W. So these are the ones we know. We know this picture is not complete. Uh, we suspect that there are other things that you'll learn about, like the Higgs particle. The biggest problem with this picture is something that I only alluded to briefly, and that's the dark matter. Because we know there's a lot of dark matter in the universe, we know that this apparently represents only about 5% of the universe. The rest of it's stuff we don't know. It's in this, we don't know what it is. It's in this room with us. I don't know about you, but I'm scared. <laughs> it's all around us, but we don't understand it. So that's where we're going at the laboratory. Uh, things that you will be touched on, not so much. All this theory, string theory, so on. We will be more practical in these lectures, but these other things uh, do exist. We're doing all these experiments to try and detect them. Fermi Lab's actively involved in two dark matter experiments. We're trying to understand something that I didn't talk to you very much about, but we understand that the universe is accelerating apart now due to something called the dark energy. What is that? I mentioned, at least to some of you, uh, something about string theory, but there's all kinds of reasons to suspect that space may be more complicated and time than we thought, and maybe that complication is hidden away in extra dimensions and so on. So the, the world here is very interesting.